Hey guys, um, so for today you finished The Girl with All the Gifts, um, and as I was rereading this, the ending that is, um, I remembered why this is one of my favorite books. Um, now that we know what the ending essentially is, um, Gallagher ends up getting eaten, Dr. Caldwell succumbs to the blood poisoning that she sustained um, from wounds to her hands whenever they escaped the base. Um, Sergeant Parks is bitten and um, changes into a hungry and then Melanie shoots him at his request. Um, and Miss Justino is the last living actual human uh, that we know about. Um, and Melanie has released the spores. She is the trigger event that has set off um, the release of the, the spores, the seeds from the fruit on, um, the kind of, like, mushroom trees that grow from the hungry's bodies after so long, and they've gone into the air, and whatever humans are still out there, we know are zombie, regular old humans <laughs> for that much longer. They're going to be turning into hungry's, um, so they go from humanity 1.0 to... We'll get to that in a second. Um, yeah, and then Melanie becomes the kind of de facto leader of the little pack of hungry kids that she has discovered in the depths of London. And uh, Miss Justino is back in the role of teacher. Can only go outside in an environmental suit, living her life in Rosie, and going out to teach the children. Um, the, the reason why I like this kind of ending, not just in um, The Girl with All the Gifts, but um, in other um, kinds of novels, too, is that um, the way that I always frame them is it's not a happy ending, um, but it's not like a terrible ending either. Um, it's an ending where there is a kind of hope for the future. And you may be like, Courtney, that sounds like BS. Humans are essentially extinct. Yes, correct. <laughs> Let me clarify what I mean by this. Um we have a new kind of species of human that now exists, which is Melanie and the Hungry Children. Uh, and we'll, I'll talk more about it in a second, but we know that they are actually the offspring of people who were infected with cordyceps. And um, so they're like, so there's humans and then there were the Hungries and then there's Melanie's group and they are the children of humans who were infected. Uh, and a Apparently, we're still copulating like humans do. Uh, <laughs> whatever. Um, just think of the logistics of that for a second. Hungries. Getting it on. It implies that there's a fair amount of hungry sex. You know, that... At least the book doesn't go down that road. That is... I mean, like, that's an implication. That aside. Um, the kind of hope for the future is that there are these children... And Melanie kind of embodies how resilient um, and smart and adaptable um, they really are. And again, we'll get into that more in a minute. But so there's this kind of hope that still exists at the end of the book, even if humanity itself is essentially extinct at this moment. Um, I will tell you that if you want to know more about the world of the girl with all the gifts, both what happened prior to this novel, but during the breakdown, um, if you want more of a look at that, um, and if you want to know what actually happens to Melanie and Miss Justino and the hungry children after the events of this book, read, um, you can actually see it right here, read The Boy on the Bridge. This is really good too. I like, this is my favorite, um, but The Boy on the Bridge is also really, 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 really good. Um, in some ways, I think that like, I, I, I don't think this is too scary of a novel. It's kind of disturbing sometimes. Um, but The Boy on the Bridge is actually really kind of scary because it really is about the breakdown um, of humanity in the wake of the, the hungry virus. And I kind of wish that I brought my copy with me now because I want to reread it, but it's in my apartment and I am not going back there anytime soon. Okay. <laughs> um... All right, so here's what I want to talk about. I kind of drew myself like a little diagram here. Um, where do I want to start with this? Let's not start with a reading quite yet. Um, let's talk about the kind of uh, 
biblical dimensions of the girl with all the gifts. What I'm going to suggest to you guys um, is that Melanie, even though she's a hungry, <laughs> a special kind of hungry, um, is that she is actually representative of humanity. So I'm talking about go way back, if you know your Bible stories, go way back to Genesis when God creates the world and then he creates Adam and Eve. Melanie is actually in some ways representative of Adam and Eve, and in particular Eve, and I'm going to get to why here in a moment. Um, so she is representative of kind of collective humanity. Uh, Miss Justino, who is her teacher, who is over her, who Melanie looks up to, she can do no wrong, right? She is this Christ figure. If you know um, your New Testament, then you know that like I think I talked about this in a previous video. Uh, God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus are like one little triangular. They're all the same thing. <laughs> They're talked about in Christianity as being both three things, but also all together they form one, which is God. If you're not familiar with Christianity, I know you're going to be like, Courtney, roll with me. Um, and so Miss Justino kind of occupies this God position for us in the text, at, at least for Melanie. Um, and we see that again because Melanie constantly looks up to her. Miss Justino acts as her teacher. Um, and then we have this really interesting story of Pandora in her box of evils. And I told you that Melanie is representative also two of Pandora, that she and Pandora function as the same figure. So Melanie is Melanie and Pandora and Eve all at once. Um, the Eve and Pandora stories actually have a lot in common. Uh, so what Pandora does is she opens that box of evil and she releases them into the world. Um, what Eve does in the Garden of Eden is she plucks the apple or whatever fruit and she eats it and then she shares it with Adam and that is how sin or evil is released into the world. What Melanie does is whenever Sergeant Parks is like delirious because he is he has been bitten. Um, she somehow is like, you know, yeah, we're going to get through this. All you need to do is go up and fire the big fire. I don't know. What, what, what is it? It's just some kind of fire gun. Flamethrower? <laughs> um, and aim it straight for that wall of cordyceps, which is ahead of us because they've run into this wall. It's essentially like a, a forest of cordyceps. Um, and there's a bunch of fruit in there. And Melanie realizes what she needs to do since she has seen those hungry children and explored that forest. And she gets Sergeant Parks to do that for her um, because he's delirious. And we know that like, you know, all of the neural connections are kind of being invaded in his brain. So he can't think clearly. He just does what she says, thinking this is how we're going to escape. She's right, because he's come to trust her. Um, <clears throat> and what happens essentially is that is the trigger event um, that releases all of the spores into the air so that any humans that were outside essentially of Rosie are going to now be hungries so that there are no more humans except for Miss Justino. <laughs> um, poor Miss Justino, that's really bleak for her um, but it's not for Melanie and the children like her and I would say it's not for readers either. Um, so in, in doing that, Melanie getting those spores released, that is like opening the box of Pandora's evil. That is like Eve eating the apple. Um, and part of what what hinges uh, for Eve and Adam in the biblical story too is that they're supposed to not eat fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's knowledge that is supposed to be kept from them by God. Now this is kind of weird because it's like, well, we know that Miss Justino was a teacher, so she was providing Melanie with knowledge. Yes, you would be absolutely correct. But Miss Justino's job was also partly to keep some knowledge from her students, mainly what they were. Um, and Melanie's, a lot of Melanie's journey throughout the book, um, and I'll talk more about this in my next video, um, but a lot of her journey is that she moves from being kind of ignorant of her world and not understanding it to fully better than anybody else in the novel, understanding her world and being able to move in it and manipulating it to get the desired outcome that she wants. She undergoes a journey of knowledge and self-exploration in the novel 
And I am going to read that section um, where she finally gets the truth about what she really is and what children like her are from Dr. Caldwell. And that is really the light bulb moment for her where she goes, okay, I get it now. I have I have the knowledge. And that is equivalent to, again, Eve eating the apple, Pandora opening the box of evils. It's, um, it's a really kind of beautiful metaphor, I think, the way that it's woven uh, through the text. Um, okay, so now let's turn to um, some quick readings of the novel. Um, I only want to look at like three passages, um, and then I'm going to talk about the kind of evolution of humanity in the novel, which I've talked about in previous videos. Okay, 378. Oh, I was already there. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip around a little bit here. I'm going to read from the top of the first full paragraph on page 378. I'm going to read one, two, three paragraphs, and then I'm going to stop and go to the very bottom of 378. Okay. To the newly infected, Caldwell says, Ophiocordyceps, and this is, um, this is Dr. Caldwell explaining to Melanie what exactly she has discovered about what Melanie is and how cordyceps really works. To the newly infected, Caldwell says, Ophiocordyceps is utterly without mercy. It batters down the door, breaks and enters, devours and controls. Then it finally turns what's left of the host into a bag of fertilizer from which the fruiting body grows. We've seen this in the novel. But we were wrong about how quickly the human substrate is destroyed. The fungus targets different brain areas with differing speed and severity. It shuts down higher order thought. It enhances hunger and the triggers for hunger. But we'd assumed that all drives outside of that, all behaviors that didn't serve the parasite's agenda, were embargoed at the same time. In other words, meaning that like the only thing that the the infected person was interested in because the parasite was interested in it was eating. They didn't think that reproduction was on the table anymore. <laughs> when I saw that woman in the street in Stevenage and the man in the care home, I could see that wasn't the case. Both of them were still making connections haphazardly to their former lives, as we discussed. They were engaging in odd behaviors, pushing a pram, singing, looking at old photographs. They were completely without function as far as the parasite was concerned. I'm going to skip all the way down to the bottom of page 378 now. I realized that you might have been born with the infection. She's addressing Melanie now. That your parents might have already infected you when you were conceived. We thought that was impossible, that hungries couldn't have a sex drive. But once I'd seen the survival of other human drives and emotions, mother love and loneliness, it didn't seem impossible at all. So Dr. Caldwell is actually noting here that these humans have retained human qualities. And it is some of those human qualities that has led to the creation of Melanie and children like her. With that in mind, I went back to the cytological evidence. I was fortunate enough to be able to attain a fresh sample of brain tissue from the boy, Melanie says, you killed him and cut off his head. Oh yeah, there's that whole disaster. <laughs> we don't even, holy shit, right? Okay, I'm gonna continue now. Yes, I did, and his brain was very different from a normal hungry brain. With the equipment I had back at the base, it was pretty much all I could do to verify and map the presence of the fungus. With this, she indicates with a nod the head of the microtome, the centrifuge, the scanning electron microscope. I could look at individual neurons and how the fungal cells interacted with them. The boy here and the man from the care home, they were so different there was almost no way to compare them. The fungus utterly wrecks the brain of a first-generation hungry goes through it like a train. The chemicals it secretes, the brute, the brute force triggers that turn specific behaviors on and off, they cause terrible damage as they accumulate, and the fungus is drawing nutrients from the brain tissue too. The brain is progressively hollowed out, sucked dry. In the second generation, that's you, referring to Melanie, the fungus is spread evenly throughout the brain. It is thoroughly interwoven with the dendrites of the host neuron. In some places, it actually replaces them, but it doesn't feed on the brain. It gets, your, it gets its nourishment only when the host eats. It becomes a true symbiote rather than a parasite. I'm getting like really excited um, because I love environmental science and things like that. Um, so when something is symbiotic rather than parasitic, it works in tandem with whatever the host is. It doesn't harm the host. It works to actually enhance the host. 
um, for example, like some of the bacteria that are that's in your gut, you would say you could say that's symbiotic. It's not there to harm you. It's actually there to help you digest. Um, whereas something that is parasitic takes away from the host and kills it for its own good. That's the way cordyceps typically works. In children like Melanie, who are second generation hungries, cordyceps becomes symbiotic, and that means that. Uh, cordyceps is no longer feeding off those human bodies and using them just for its own agenda. It is working together with the body. You have a melding of the human and the natural world, this fungus, into one being that functions better than either humans or hungries. It is a second generation of hungry that is superior to both because it has been combined with cordyceps. It's amazing. I love this idea. This is part of the reason that I love the book so much because what um, it actually also gestures toward is um, deep human interconnectedness with the natural world and how that can actually be super beneficial. That's another metaphorical reading of it. I'm gonna calm down now and just keep reading this passage. Miss Justineau said my mother was dead, Melanie objects. It's almost a protest, as though a lie from Helen Justineau is a thing that can have no place in the world. We've talked about why that is. That was our best guess, Caldwell says, that your parents were junkers or other survivors who'd never made it to Beacon, and that you and they had all been fed on and infected at the same time. We had no model for hungries copulating, still less for them giving birth in the wild and the babies somehow surviving. You must be much hardier and more self-sufficient than normal Normal human infants. Perhaps you were able to feed on the flesh of your mother until you were strong enough to... Don't, Melanie says sharply. Don't talk about things like that. But talking is all that Caldwell has left now, and she can't stop herself. She talks about her observations, her theory, her success, and working out the pathogen's life cycle, and her failure. There's no immunity, no vaccine, no conceivable cure. Sorry, I got really excited. Um, she tells Melanie where to find her slides and the rest of her notes and who to give them to when they get to Beacon. When it becomes harder for Caldwell to talk, Melanie comes closer and sits at her feet. The scalpel is still clutched in her hand, but she doesn't bully or threaten now. She just listens, and Caldwell is full of gratitude because she knows what this lethargy that's flooding through her means. Um, yeah, so uh, let's talk about the evolution of the human in this novel then. Um, you have Humanity 1.0, which has been referred to in the novel several times, and that would be like us, right? Regular old humans doing whatever weird shit we do. A lot of weird shit. If you watch reality TV, you know that. <laughs> um, and then you could argue that Humanity 2.0, the hungries, those people who were humans, who were born regular humans and were infected with cordyceps, right? That's humanity 2.0, and they prey upon humanity 1.0. Melanie and children like her are humanity 3.0. They um, are the perfect meld of human and the more than human into something that is greater than original humanity or the hungries. They are something that is both at once um, and that apparently is much better at surviving and adapting. They're more intelligent. They're um, more physically fit, right? Uh, and, you know, based off the interactions we saw from the pack of hungry children, although they did eat Gallagher. Okay, let's put that aside for a minute. They ate Gallagher. Okay. <laughs> They're not perfect. Um... If putting that aside for a moment, they actually seem to function really well as a society themselves, like the, the Humanity 3.0 does. Um, whenever Melanie is finally confessing to Miss Justineau what she really saw in the theater, she talks about how um, they all worked collectively together and how it was actually fun and the leader actually protected this, the, the littler hung, like littler, littler hungries from like the older ones to make sure that they weren't bullied. Um, that's not something most governments do. Don't know if you guys have noticed that. That's not something most governments do. It's not the way they usually roll. Uh, and so they function better than humanity 1.0 or 2.0. And so Melanie is like, I'm going to ensure that children like me are no longer cut up and put in cages and treated terribly 
and I recognize that we are the superior species and I'm going to make sure that we are the species that survives. And that's why she elicits the trigger event. Um, I find that really exciting. Uh, this idea that humans evolve and become better because of the introduction of a plant into the body. It's really messy along the way, as, as evolution tends to be. Um, but it ends, like I said, on a, on a note of hope that I find really beautiful in this kind of novel. And that I think you'll appreciate, too, if you read The Boy on the Bridge. Um, let's look at pages 398 through 399. Do, do, do. Okay, I'm going to start at the bottom of page 398. This is um, Sergeant and Melanie sitting outside of Rosie now um, after they have used the little flamethrower. So Sergeant starts. We burned it, Sergeant asks. Yes, he sighs. The sound has a liquid undertow. Bullshit, he groans. This stuff in the air, it's the fungus, right? What did we do, kid? Tell me or I'll take that gun away from you and send you to bed early. <laughs> Jeez, Sergeant Parks. Melanie resigns herself. She didn't want to trouble him with this stuff when he's dying, but she won't lie to him after he's asked her for the truth. There are pods, she says, pointing towards the fungus wall, where the fungus wall is still burning. In there, pods full of seeds. Dr. Caldwell said this was the fungus's mature form, and the pods were meant to break open and spread the seeds on the wind. But the pods are very tough, and they can't open by themselves. Dr. Caldwell said they needed something to give them a push and make them open. She called it an environmental trigger. And I remember the trees in the rainforest that need a big fire to make their seeds grow. I used to have a picture of them on the wall of my cell back at the base. Parks is struck dumb with the horror of what he's just done. Melanie strokes his hand contrite. That's why I didn't want to tell you, she says. I knew it would make you sad. But Parks shakes his head. As hard as it is for her to explain, it's a lot harder for him to understand. She can see that it's hard for him to even hard for him even to frame the words. Ophiocordyceps is demolishing the parts of his brain, his mind it doesn't need, leaving him less and less to think with. In the end, he settles for why? Because of the war, Melanie tells him, and because of the children, the children like her, the second generation, or as I'm calling them, Humanity 3.0. There's no cure for the hungry plague, but in the end, the plague becomes its own cure. It's terribly, terribly sad for the people who get it first, but their children will be okay, and they'll be the ones who live and grow up and have children of their own and make a new world. But only if you let them grow up, she finishes. If you keep shooting them and cutting them into pieces and throwing them into pits, nobody will be left to make a new world. Your people and the Junker people will keep killing each other, and you'll both kill the Hungries wherever you find them, and in the end, the world will be empty. This way is better. Everybody turns into a hungry all at once, and that means they'll all die, which is really sad. But the children will grow up, and they won't be the old kind of people, but they won't be hungries either. They'll be different, like me and the rest of the kids in the class. They'll be the next people, the ones who make everything okay again. This is a really beautiful notion to end on. We can really see Melanie's reasoning here. She is saying, I understand, on her journey to knowledge throughout the novel, she has gotten a clear look at the evil that is committed by people like Sergeant Parks, Dr. Caldwell, the Junkers, um, the, the kind of evil, too, that is committed by the first generation of Hungries. And she says, the world can't continue on in this kind of state of evil. And to eliminate that, I have to turn everybody into a hungry and make sure that their children, the second generation of hungries, humanity 3.0, are nurtured and grow up better. Uh, and that's where Miss Justino comes in, right? Um, this is kind of a correction. If we're still talking in biblical metaphors here, you might say that um, humans return to the Garden of Eden in this scenario. They are purged of their evil ways, of their sin, by opening the box of evils. Um, again, think of Miss Justino as this kind of godlike Christ figure who teaches them and is going to help enable this to happen. Uh, I find it a really beautiful notion um, that these children are the ones who are going to make a better world. It's also just kind of like... Uh, I, a note from the way that we talk about um, 
why teachers are so important, that they are educating the next generation who are going to do better than previous generations have done. That's a kind of narrative, um, at, at least in the West, um, whenever we talk about educating children, and it, it's a kind of narrative that the book taps into here as well. The last passage I want to look at is the very end of the novel, pages 402 through 403. Um, I do feel kind of bad for Miss Justino, but she accepts her position here. I'm going to start on page 402 right up at the top. She's just woken up because she got knocked over the head and has been passed out for like dozens of pages now. Looking out of the window, Justino can see that it's snowing, gray snow, tiny flakes of it, more like a sifting of dust really, but coming down endlessly out of the sky. When she realizes what it is she's seeing, she starts to cry. Hours pass. The sun climbs in the sky. Justino imagines that its light is dimmed a little, as though the gray seeds are making a curtain in the upper air. Melanie comes walking back to Rosie, through the tidal flurries of the end of the world. She waves to Justino through the window, then points to the door. She's going to come inside. The airlock cycles very slowly, while Melanie carefully sprays her already disinfectant-covered body with a layer of liquid fungicide. I'm coming back. I'll take care of you. Justino understands what that means now, how she'll live, and what she'll be. And she laughs through choking tears at the rightness of it. Nothing is forgotten, and everything is paid. Meaning, she's getting her her karma, her due, for hitting and killing that little boy with her car before the breakdown. Even if she could, she wouldn't haggle about the price. The airlock's inner door opens. Melanie runs to her and embraces her, gives her love without hesitation or limit, whether it's earned or not, and at the same time pronounces sentence on her. Get dressed, she says happily. Come and meet them. The children. Sullen. <laughs> this is kind of, it's like, this is a funny image to me. Uh, the children, sullen and awkward, sitting cross-legged on the ground, cowled into silence by Melanie's fierce warning glares. Justino has only the haziest memories of the night before, but she can see the awe in their eyes as Melanie walks among them, shushing them sternly. Justino fights a queasy wave of claustrophobia. It's quite hot inside the sealed environmental suit, and she's already thirsty, even though she just drank about half her own weight in water from Rosie's filtration tank. She sits down on the sill of the midsection door. She has a marker pen in her hand. Rosie herself will be the whiteboard. Good morning, Miss Justineau, Melanie says. A murmur rises and falls as some of the other children, more than half, try to imitate her. Good morning, Melanie, Justineau replies, and then good morning, class. She draws on the side of the tank a capital A and a lowercase a. Greek myths and quadratic equa equations will come later. Um, again, I find this, this ending really, really beautiful for reasons that I've already discussed. And I want to talk here about Miss Justino's role. Bless you, Missy. Cat just sneezed. I don't know if that, if this picked up on it, but she just, she just gave a little baby sneeze. Um, she's allergic to herself. Maybe she's allergic to humans, actually. I don't know. That would be fair since I'm allergic to cats. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> Miss Justino, um realizes that she's the last human 1.0 in existence because of what has happened with the trigger event um, and that her role forever until she dies essentially um, is going to be to live in Rosie and whenever she comes out she's always going to have to wear an environmental suit and she is going to be a teacher to humanity 3.0 She's going to teach them just as she taught the children back at the base. And Melanie is going to be the facilitator between Miss Justino and the hungry children that they find, that they teach, and that they show how to be better in this post-apocalyptic world. Um, and so, again, going along with the kind of biblical metaphor, um, Miss Justino still acts as that god figure kind of contained because of the fact that she has to be in this environmental suit so not fully accessible but also simultaneously fully accessible to humanity 3.0 um, because now they have this go-between that is melanie um, and she kind of 
is what is going to allow this new world to come about. Uh, again, Melanie is the girl with all the gifts. <laughs> she is the girl who creates a new world in this book. That is what it's about. It, to me, Melanie creating a new and a better world for the future. Um, also, I, I told you guys that if you enjoyed um, this novel, to go and read the, the Boy on the Bridge. I think it's way scarier. Um, but again, it'll tell you what happened before, and you'll get to see what happens afterward. Um, and uh, also, if you like this novel and you want something kind of comparable, um, that is really the most terrifying book I've ever read, but is so, so, so good, and is also about a little girl who saves the world, uh, then you need to go read The Passage by Justin Cronin. Do not watch the TV show. Go and read the book series. There's three books. They're really good. They're going to take you a long time to get through, but they are excellent. Um, I highly recommend them. All right, you guys, I hope you have enjoyed The Girl with All the Gifts. Again, obviously, I can't stop smiling because I love this book so much. I think the ending is fantastic. Um, and up next, I'm going to talk about some leadership and how it is displayed in this novel. I'll see you in that video.